Lost Lancastrian, Episode 10 In Bloom As I record this, I'm actually sat here watching quite possibly one of the most beautiful sunrises in quite some time. That's a little off the cuff, but I kind of just thought I'd like to share that. It's been a couple of weeks since blossom season began in Edinburgh, and it's now almost over yet I'm still trying to cling to it. I did venture out several times to enjoy the brief delight. Stretching across the open grass parkland that is the meadows, branched walkways are lined with cherry blossom trees. These tree-lined footpaths explode in the spring with a riot of pink and fuchsia tones that contrasts the strident turtle green of the grass. I had been waiting for this moment for the longest time. It feels like an eternity has passed in waiting. A grey, dark and damp and cold eternity. I would say it's been a long winter, but it really hasn't. There's barely been a true winter this time. It was just months of what I can only describe as meh. There were few, if any, truly cold, crisp and frosty days. In the city there has been barely a scatter of snow, even when outside of the city got a brief blanket. Mostly there's been the grey, the damp, and then the storms. The blossoming trees in the meadows are the true metamorphosis moment, the point where it's undeniable that spring is here and change is upon us. I never used to think much about spring when I was younger. It was a middling season, a season without definitive character or emotional attachment. I liked the last gasp colours of autumn and the determined grit of winter. Yet, as I've gotten older, spring has changed for me as I've begun to see it as full of character, a character of hope and potential. Where the idea of making resolutions in the midwinter chill never made much sense to me, the idea of embracing new starts in spring seems entirely natural. Still, the beauty I see in spring is not an assurance. There is promise in spring but no assured predictions. As the life of summer may seem a foregone conclusion, but it really isn't. Summer can and probably will bring disaster. Spring isn't the promise of a conquering hero. It is hope in the truer sense of the word. 
The old Britonic and Gaelic tribes of the British Isles, northern Spain and France, told stories that in spring, the green man gave up malevolence and solitude, marrying the May Queen, and together they forged new life and possibilities into the world. A partnership of creative equals. Margaret Sussman, a Jewish poet, essayist and philosopher from early 20th century Germany, once said, The messianic hope is hope without a foundation. Something perhaps quite controversial for a Jewish thinker of the time, but she'd already seen the flaw in hoping for an individual saviour. She'd also seen, and played her part in, the success of early feminist movements and the strengths of collective action. Indeed, the book in which she considered this flawed placement of hope, Judaism, a World Religion, was published in 1932. She would go on to see how dangerous people seeking hope in the individual heroic figure could be. Like in the Dune series of books, hope in heroes and hierarchy leads only to opening the doors to abuse of that hope and the perpetuation of our collective subservience. There is no individual in spring, no exclusivity. Although some may attempt to cage the beauty to create exclusive space, it cannot be easily contained. As Ian Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Many of the private gardens for residents of particular squares and circuses in Edinburgh are still beautiful from outside the iron fences and the front garden spaces of the tenements are still open to public view, surrounding anyone on the streets with life and nature. The twittering songs of spring birds carry far beyond the caged trees and hedgerows, so that the cobbled roads may be a countryside village. This also made me consider a recent podcast I'd listened to from the Pod Save America crew and the movie they were discussing. The film, The Social Network, is purportedly the true story of Facebook's origins. In the film, there's an assertion made that the reason Facebook was successful where MySpace and Friendster failed was exclusivity. In the Offline Movie Club podcast, this got discussed and very much taken apart. It's certainly a neat story, and looks to be the unique factor at first glance. But of course it's never that simple. To quote John and Hank Green of Vlogbrothers fame, Truth resists simplicity. The truth is the exclusivity model nearly buried Facebook. It had gained some popularity in its early testing grounds not by beating MySpace, but by beating the university's various systems that Facebook copied and put in one place. As they attempted to grow beyond the safe spaces of academic audiences, their exclusivity model got in the way, and MySpace was still cooler. The walled garden spaces of social media didn't exist back then, and the people on the internet at the time were used to the anarchistic liberty of the World Wide Web. The restrained, regimented, Kafkaesque controlled environment of Facebook was largely seen as an abhorrence. The rock star like attempts at hero CEO was cringeworthy. MySpace was led by your first mate on the site, Tom, who welcomed you on board in his 
no statements statement of a white t-shirt. So, like a cul-de-sac of crazies, with no HOA to dictate the keep and appearance of their lawns, MySpace thrived. It was a community of gardens gone wild. Some were neat, meditative, zen spaces like calming Japanese gardens. Others were wild meadows of peculiarities and unexpected turns, daring you to follow their wibbledy path through the wild growth. My space couldn't get boring, because there was near infinite possibilities with each page. There were also few barriers to communication between users and it was incredibly easy to find new people and shared interests. The truth is that both these factors, the freedom and openness, would be the open doors to the true killers of MySpace. While the internet was mostly a place frequented by uncool geeks and nerds, the complexity factors that come with liberty were fine. As more and more average folk started trying to join in, though, they found things like MySpace intimidating. Facebook didn't require any thinking, didn't need you to learn anything new or create anything unique and expressive. You just needed to fill out a form and attach a photo something just about everyone in industrialized societies has extensive experience of. Likewise, the openness of MySpace made the finding of like-minded people easy. It also meant getting spammed by porn accounts was easy. Added to this, MySpace was attempting to build a sustainable business, built on its profitability, so they were selling ad space from day one. Internet ads at the time were truly terrible and notoriously unprofitable. MySpace began to look increasingly like a shit virtual Times Square with garish animated banner ads for sex dolls and Viagra everywhere. Facebook got all its money from venture capitalists and was prepared to run at an eye-watering loss rate. Still, it actually took Facebook a long time to build its audience and it was only when they opened the garden gate to everyone that it began to take off. The real growth came when the users of MySpace had finally had enough of the spam and over-advertising. There was a similar story with Friendster only minus the freedom and creativity part. Facebook basically did something that is common tactic of monopolizers. They used investor capital to undercut their competition. After all, the costs to consumers of media has always been advertising. When there's too much advertising, the cost is too high. So Facebook was basically offering something for free, and there was no way for either MySpace or Friendster to compete. Yet Facebook was still boring, regimented, and lacked engagement. So they tried introducing silly games and throwing sheep at your friends. All little novelties that lost their appeal fairly quickly. It wasn't until they introduced the algorithmic newsfeed that everything changed. As engagement rose and their competition died, Facebook did the inevitable. They started selling ads. The need to sell ads in an algorithm world meant the need for more data, more people. People who got used to less control, fewer decisions, to Zuck or some other tech mogul being their messiah. 
Yet with the price rising and a few other competitors out there, the story looks to be shifting again as people's behaviour is shifting. Gradually, people are spending less time on social media. Surprisingly, cinema and theatre audiences have started to grow. Engagement in online spaces is increasingly via private messaging. People seem to be seeking more real-world experiences, not the metaverse virtual world. I actually saw a sign of this recently down in Dean Village. This is one of the most photographed and shared areas of Edinburgh on social media, yet it's a little out of the way, so tourists have been somewhat few. Yet my most recent walk down there, I found quite a number of tourists. What was surprising though, was that most of them were simply stood there, taking in the experience. No phones out to capture the gram, no yelling to their TikTok flickers. Just quietly enjoying a beautiful and peaceful place. This could be a post-lockdown desire for the outdoors or something, but it seems to be more than that. Open discussions of loneliness and an increasing emphasis on the importance of friendship seems to be on the rise. Membership of unions is increasing, volunteering and community participation has increased. Immanuel Kant, in his critique of pure reason, said, All interests of my reason, the speculative as well as the practical, is united in the following three questions. 1. What can I know? 2. What should I do? 3. What may I hope? He goes on to say that hope is simultaneously practical and theoretical, so that practical leads like a clue to a reply to the theoretical question and, in its highest form, the speculative question. That is, hope has a foundation of fact, but holds no certainty, only an indication of what could be. Hope allows us to see possible futures, if we try. And this is spring to me. Breaking out beyond the walled garden or private residence space is barricaded by cast iron. The inconvenience of life to the would-be monopolists and autocrats, the desire to control and herd us for their own convenience and enrichment. In New Haven, on the northern shores of Edinburgh, there is one of the city's most delightful and beautiful garden spaces. The park, named like a 70s sci-fi TV show, Starbank Park, was originally a walled garden for a significant mansion house that belonged to the uncle of William Gladstone, the famed British Prime Minister of the Victorian era. The house and grounds were originally left to the Leith Town Council and the people of Leith and New Haven, with the house becoming the residence of the groundskeeper. Today, the house is split into two apartments for retired council staff. The once walled garden is now taken care of by volunteers from the local community and supported by a community members organisation. The once regimented and contained has been opened up into a creative, raucous explosion of life and colour, holding the promise of what is possible together. Yet so many people still doubt, still cannot see beyond the fog of suffering, Returning to Margaret Sussman, she said in connection to hope and suffering, 
In this being other, we at the same time grasp our deepest particularity. What we humans actually are, we are by way of our homelessness in the world. Through our death, and through the knowledge of our impending death, human life is per se existence in an alien world, and as such, suffering. This is to say that our knowledge of our mortality causes our sense of suffering. Or perhaps more to the point, our focus on our mortality causes our suffering. We devise ways to distract or control the undeniable truth of our temporality. But they tend to fail us. To quote the Barbie movie, ideas can last forever, but humans don't. So we create ideas to cope with the ridiculousness of that. Ideas like Barbie or even patriarchy. So they may outlast us and in a way continue us. We can continue us through the dysfunction of hierarchy, the foundationless hope in a messiah, or we can create through common cause. A cause can continue on, the true embodiment of the immortal idea, and it requires no individual person to continue it or hold it together. This is the story of the Foundation series of books by Isaac Asimov, a tale that spans centuries, millennia even, as the Empire, a system literally dependent on a single person reborn over and over, collapses, and the hope for civilization is the perpetuation of an idea shared by a community. No individuals have any greater significance beyond their efforts to maintain the shared idea. There are no great heroes to save us. Only us, together. In other words, we can hope for a hero to save us, or we can let hope guide us as we build a beautiful garden together. And now, as the sun's up, and the birds are calling, I'm going to bid you farewell, and hope you have a great day. And if you could please leave a rating or review for this podcast, that would really help. Thanks for listening. <laughs>